this place. Lord, have your way. Take control. We're excited about what you're doing.
Jesus.
awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. none like you. There's nothing that is greater than your love. Nothing that is greater for your love than us. I was reminded of this today. I was sitting and I was holding my 11 week old son and I was just thanking God for him. Just how much I love him and how much every breath inside of me I breathe and I, I love with every being on the inside of me and it was as if God just spoke to me so clearly and he reminded me but I love him even more than you. I love him even more than you could ever imagine. And that's how God is looking at you tonight. As much love as I have for this innocent child that, that I brought life into more than, more than anything. I love him more than anything. God loves him so much more. And tonight, God wants to remind you that more than anything, he loves you greater than any love that you can imagine, greater than any love that you could have for your spouse or for your children. He loves you more than that. And so don't forget that tonight, that the God that we sing holy, 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 that every creation, every piece of creation will one day call the name of Jesus. One day every tongue shall confess the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That same King that created the world is looking at you with nothing but love tonight so be encouraged in that that greater than any circumstance greater than any situation he loves you just re be reminded of that tonight father we give you this time thank you for loving us in spite of who we are sometimes thank you for loving us in spite of our failures and the things that we do father we give you this time take control of this service and change lives tonight take us deeper in your word and teach us new things about you in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and cross the aisles and tell someone it's good to be at faith tonight.
Well, good evening. Welcome to Faith. If this is your first time, let me be one of the first people to welcome you to Faith. We're privileged that you are here with us as our guest tonight. We're thankful that you are here. Just a few announcements. There's always something going on at Faith. 55 plus. On May 17th, you're going to be going to Newman's Castle. The cost is $15, and that includes the tour and lunch. It's from 9 to 4 p.m., and that's on May 17th for 55 plus, $15. If you have more information, you can check the Information Center. Uh, all church, everyone turn your ears on. This is for you. Our all church annual, all church picnic is this coming Sunday, May 19th. It is going to be at the Langham Creek Family YMCA. It is at the corner of Logan Bow and Queenston over in the Copperfield area. Uh, probably about a 15-minute drive from here, so you won't want to miss it. It's this Sunday. If you have not already signed up, you need to sign up so that we can get a headcount for food. I believe it's $5 a person. You can't get lunch for $5 a person. So you need to bring your whole family out. There's going to be fun and games and everything for everyone. Everyone is welcome, and there's something for everyone at our annual church picnic. It's going to be awesome. Ladies, this is for you. This Friday in two days, May 17th, we're going to be having our pink night. It's called Pink Night. We have a special guest coming all the way from College Station. She's a cancer survivor. She's a lovely woman. Her name is Ginger Freeze. She has an incredible story to tell, and it's going to be full of laughter and maybe a few tears. Probably not lots of laughs. There's always lots of laughs at ladies' events. You won't want to miss it. Bring a salad, I believe, to share. Bring a salad to share. And there will be child care provided for $5 a child. So you just need to register at the Information Center if you do need child care so that we can make sure that we have enough workers for that evening. But it should be an awesome time. So I hope to see all of you ladies there. It's going to be awesome. Pastor Don. All right, ushers, let's worship the Lord tonight with our tithes and offerings, if you will. It's always good to be able to do that. I love to give. And if you don't see people putting it in the bucket, it's because they give online. So don't go look at your neighbor and expect to see them. You know, they're, they do it online, so that's, that's okay. Father, we thank you. We worship you and we praise you tonight, Lord. We thank you for all of your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you, Father, for being with us even when we don't deserve it. We thank you for lo your love, and I ask your blessings on everyone ton tonight as they give. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everybody. How are we? Good? Pretty good? Who does not have notes but would like to participate in taking notes tonight? Please raise your hand. Fantastic. Raj is on his way up. We did a last minute. We, we, we were able to hand out all of those handouts that we made. Praise God. That means more of you are starting to come and enjoy this series. And uh, while these notes are being passed out, I'd like to encourage those of you that are watching online from time to time. I get emails and phone calls saying, I enjoyed the service online. So I always like to address those that are online. Please click the date that you see highlighted. Obviously, you're in the right place because you're watching us. But you can also follow along in taking notes or at least reading the notes that I will be referencing. Hopefully, that will be helpful to you. By the way, we've, we're in a series entitled The Book of Nehemiah. It's a pretty creative title because that's the book we're studying. I hope you've enjoyed studying Nehemiah. I hope you've taken the, literally the, the, uh, the initiative that I put before you a couple of weeks ago in that we should be mentored by the prophets. You should see the teaching of the prophets as meaningful for you today, as if you're sitting in front of someone who is full of wisdom and experience, right? And practical application in their life. And you can say, okay, as you read this, what are you speaking to me, Father, through this man's experience or through this woman's experience, whatever you're reading in the Scripture? And what we've asked God to do is guide us through the life of Nehemiah and not just teach us but mentor us. 
Many times, I told you last week, my quest for a mentor, right? Remember, I kind of got all sloppy-eyed at the end. And the point of me telling you that was I looked for mentorship in all kinds of places. I looked for it in people. I looked for it in books. I've read books. I've listened to podcasts. Trust me, if it's out there, I've probably heard of it, got a portion of it in me, and tried to learn from it. But my quest was empty until one day I literally got to a place where I was, I was at a pastor's conference, and I really respected the man that was speaking. And I looked at my wife. And I thought to myself, I would never, you know, and I, I haven't told her this, but she'll hear that I, I, I pretty much said in my heart, God, if you want me to leave everything that you've put in front of me, everything, and take my family with nothing, I would leave it all behind. If I could spend the next few months under this person's leadership, I would get a job. I know how to get a job, and I know how to work, and I know how to, you know, provide for my family. I've done it before. I, I, I'm not a position guy. I am an opportunity guy. So if this is the opportunity you want me to do, I'll leave everything and I'll go. And then the staff would be like, no, you can't do that, you big jerk. But here's the deal. I was at a place where I desperately wanted someone to speak into my life that inspired me, that, that, that put something in me that would take me forward in my life. You know, And there's just times in your life where you're constantly dishing it out. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. And not just money emotionally, you're pouring into them all the time because you want them to stay up, don't you? You want them to be encouraged. You want them to feel like life is at their fingertips no matter what, that they can dream, that they can accomplish. And many times as a coach, the coach is always coaching those around him, you can do this, and I'll show you how you can do it. But the coach himself has to have somebody speaking into him. As I fell on my face that night in worship, I heard very, very clearly, where does that man find wisdom? And in my practical thinking, I go, well, he has two or three other people in his life that he's mentioned right there. God said, no. Well, then where do they find wisdom to teach him? And it all really goes back to one place. It's the Lord. And he said, you've never asked me to mentor you. How might that look? Well, it might look something like this, wouldn't it? Lord, give me a moment as I create space for you right now. Mentor me through these pages, through these lives that you call precious through those that have carried your gospel through fire, literally, right? Through floods, through the desert, through the most difficult places, and they've done it well. Show me how I can do the same thing in my context. And it just rocked my world. So as we are studying Nehemiah, that's what I want you to think about. Lord, show me as I create space for you how these words can not just fill my life with wisdom. I'm not interested in you becoming a smart Christian. Have you figured that out yet? You probably chose to come here because you knew you, <laughs> I'm not that smart and you like being as smart as me. And that's cool. I'm okay with that. But here's the deal. I don't care if you're smart as a Christian. There's a lot of Pharisees that know everything. And Jesus wasn't interested in the knowledge of man. He was interested in the obedience of the heart. He was interested in, in the one that was compassionate that wouldn't pass up the one that was broken on the side of the road. I'm not just talking his car broke down, but broken on the, on the road of life. We are, the, we are the called to have that compassionate heart, just like him. He's wanting us to be smart. He's wanting us to be mentored with the compassion of heart, not just knowledge. But it all, it, it's really nice to have that knowledge, though, isn't it? It's the knowledge of the truth that sets you free. So we're, gonna, we're asking God for both. Week one, we talked about guard your low spots. I hope you've taken the challenge to look at your life and to look at the wall, so to speak, or the area that God has called you to in this life and shore up the gaps, find the low spots, and arm those low spots. That's what Nehemiah wanted to do. And I believe if we've asked him to mentor us, we should be able to look at our life the same and find the low spots and ask God to fill them for us. Week two, we talked about staying put, right? Nehemiah. Man, he was bombed with all these requests to get off the wall, right? He had all these reasons to get off the wall. False accusations, people throwing wrong things at him, letters from the king stating supposedly that he's going to be in trouble. Listen, when your vision is so crystal clear, like this man, the, the, the clearer the vision, or the, 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 the better the vision, so to speak, the fewer the distractions, the fewer the distractions, the easier it is to make decisions. That's not my definition. Andy Stanley wrote in his book, I love that definition because it makes sense to me. The clearer my vision today, the less easy it is for me to be distracted and pulled off of task. Okay, And much easier for me then to make decisions. Because you know, if you've got 500 things in front of you, which one are you going to start with? Most of the time we don't do anything because it's too overwhelming. There's too many things to start with. Our vision is not clear enough to at least hit the one.
that we are supposed to go after. So Nehemiah in Scripture, in chapter 6, if you want to go back, it specifically says, he goes, I'm on the wall and I am not coming down. Or I'm on the wall doing a good work, the message says. And I am not coming down. You have permission, okay, if nothing else, from me, blame it on the pastor. Pastor said, I have to stay on the wall until I'm done. And he gives me permission and I know, you know, your, your, your issue is legit. But this is my calling, this is my life, this is what God's calling me to do. And if I keep running into other people's battles, I'll never get finished with what he's put me to task. If you are supposed to strengthen your home right now, then you're on the wall. And don't come down until your home has peace. If you're in a place where God's positioning you in, in, in the workplace so that you can be a light in a dark place to make things less dark, then stay on the wall and don't get distracted. I've, I have pastors call me all the time, even today. Look, there's an opportunity. There, there could be a, a chance for us to, to come together and increase the number of people. There's another church that's flailing, and, and they're looking to us and so forth. And my question to that person is this. Did God say that is a part of the plan? Because all they might be doing is pulling you into their battle. Think clearly about this. It's glamorous to have a full church with a bunch of people. It's awesome to say we merged and God increased us like that. But you've got to be careful. If God spoke it to you and the leadership is in line with that and the Holy Spirit's guiding your steps, the word becomes a lamp into your feet and light into your path and you sit back and you say, God, this is an undeniable blessing of you. They are coming together to perpetuate the one thing you've asked me to do. Then go for it. But if it's not, walk the straight and narrow and don't be pulled to right or left. Are you, are you getting it? Fantastic. Well, tonight I want to share this message which is entitled Remain Armed. It's easy for us to let our guard down when the activities of life or the enthusiastic moments of life are great. We all, you know, it, it, it's, it's in these times where we feel comfortable. It's in these times where we don't feel like we got to have the dukes up and we don't have to be on guard all the time. You know what I'm talking about? When life is just good and no one's knocking at your door, no bills to be paid, no kids to take to the doctor. You just got it going on. You can actually take a deep breath and put on the voice and watch some good singing or whatever you want to do. These are the times I'm going to encourage you to remain armed. Don't let your guard down. Don't sit back and take that deep breath and go, ah, I have arrived. Until you stand before the Father, until you're welcomed home, please don't take your guard down. Many times we do that, don't we? Then we get popped right then. If you've ever been in a fight or you've ever, been, you've ever had somebody that's just waiting for that moment, the moment you pull it down, boom, you're like, ah, what is going on? It's like you let your guard down. Well, it was fine. You hadn't, you hadn't swung at me for like six months. All right, I don't even know what that was for, but I just brought it to you. I had a question for you. Can you remember what the first attack was against Nehemiah and who it was against? And we, and let me rephrase that. As Nehemiah was going about his business, we talked about this last week. As he was going about his business, he was, he was on the wall doing good work and, and he couldn't come down. Remember Sanballat and Gershom, the little maniacal little wannabe guy goes... He, they start you know, sending false letters and accusations against them saying, don't you think the king is going to come after you and this is and that? Surely you want to meet us, right? What was this attack? Who is it against? Was it against Nehemiah or was it against somebody else? I'm leading in this question here. Say somebody else because you're smart. Somebody else, of course, it was. Nehemiah was smart enough as a leader to not take every attack of the project upon his own shoulders. I'm, I'm telling you from personal experience, today is a day I have to struggle with this. Not just I've overcome this. Listen to me. When I'm on this wall doing a good work and I'm asking God to show me as a visionary leader, step by step, what's the best thing for you in this church, this community, for Houston? All right? I have to dream forward and I have to put my heart on the table and say, this is what I believe God's telling me to do. It is not easy for me for you to think about my heart and for you to think, if, is that really God or not for me? It bothers me. It frustrates me when people don't agree with me, okay? I'm just being honest. I, I, can, I can show you no response, but on the inside I'm going, why don't you believe in me? It's wrong of me as a leader for, for me to ever, ever have the expectation that you believe in me. That would be heresy. You are to believe the God-given vision in me. I am just a vessel that God has filled you carry within you greatness like I carry within me the presence of God. So do you. I shine in places I'm supposed to shine, and you shine in places you're supposed to shine. Nehemiah would have been just a basket case if he felt like he was the Savior of the world. He was not. He was simply the man with the vision. 
Therefore, when accusations came against him, it wasn't against him. If you read the scripture, he says, God, turn these accusations back on those that fling them like a boomerang. And let them not escape what they're trying to do to us because they're coming against your workers. The workers. The people doing the, you and I down on the ground in, in the pit. Shoring up the loose ends on the wall, making it happen. When the enemy attacks, he attacks those that are doing the work. But if you're in any type of leadership capacity, you take it personal because you think people are coming after you. Think about it. Leadership. In your notes, it was a verbal assault that led to the false accusations. But in Nehemiah's prayer, it started against someone else. They've insulted, he said, the builders. I want you to write that down. I want you to forget that principle. Because as a believer, people are going to come against you because of Christianity or come against you because of Jesus. And he said, yes, you'll be persecuted for my name. You'll be persecuted, not just for who you are. Sunday, I'm going to do my best to share with you a message. And, I'm going to, I'm, and, and Paul Burkhart's trying really, really hard. He is, he is an incredible missionary to a persecuted place. And he's trying to get me through Facebook. We're, we're doing our best to reach each other. But I'm going to ask him to share with me this story again so I can share it with you of persecution. There's people out there that get beat up, raped, murdered, tortured, not because of anything other than who they are, the type of people they are. So think it for a second. We're Houstonites in Texas. And if the Texans don't like the Houstonites, then they could cross the border, so to speak, and beat us down and do whatever they want to just because we're Houstonites. That's an illustration of what I'm talking about. In places in the world, there are bullies Larger nations, whatever, more militant nations that cross borders all the time and beat people down for being a people group. And I, we have a missionary that we support that is ministering to a people group that, that have to face this all the time. I can't tell you everything, but I won't, I won't close the circle, but Sunday you'll hear more about it. They literally are tired of getting beaten up for who they are. They decided to put a cross on their church and bring persecution for Christ because they say, if we're going to get beat, if we're going to get raped, if we're going to have to face such persecution, we choose today to be facing this persecution for Christ rather than just being who we are. These are the people that we reach and pray for and send missionaries to. You understand what I'm saying? We have to understand. So I'm going to do my best Sunday to, to present that to you, but... It, it, it's, it's going in line with what Nehemiah and, and Nehemiah's prayer. God, they're not coming against me. They're coming against the workers. They're coming against those that carry your light. Now, last week we narrowed the focus. I want you to write this down again. I know it's in your notes from last week, but please do this. It's just reiteration sometimes helps. Nehemiah's role was what? What did Nehemiah have to have better than anybody else? Say it loud. Vision. He had to have the vision. Somebody has to have the vision. God's primary role, the second note I want you to take there, is this. To supernaturally provide for the vision. Nehemiah's job was to wrestle with it. He prayed, he fasted. Remember, he carried this weight on his shoulder. Nobody else carried the weight that he did. He had the vision. His job was to know that better than anyone so he could have the courage to stay on the wall. The people around him had a role too, but God had a role in the midst of it. God's role was to provide supernaturally. How well did God do? He killed it, he did awesome. He sent Nehemiah not only with enough supplies to build the wall and supernaturally provide all of that, but he sent him with enough to, you know, supplies to build his own house and to take care of everybody that was there. And people had to write letters. People that didn't even like him, they wrote letters to give him safe passage and timber and this and that. He got everything he needed. God provided it. Money didn't do it. He was a cupbearer. He had nothing. God did it. I'm setting you guys up for also another week or two down the road. I'm going to be sharing vision with you. And, and I think many, many times when vision is cast, vision is cast within the bubble of your means. So I want you to take this and apply it to your life right now. If God's calling you to do something, if you're not going because you can't see yourself providing for that, shame on you. Then it's your vision and not his. We have a vision at this church that is way beyond our capability. Just because we planted Cypress doesn't mean it stops there. That was within our means. Now we're going to start stepping into places that God is going to have to show us how he is supernaturally providing for the vision he's given to us. It's going to be a lot of fun. The last one in your notes is this. The role of the people was to come together in one heart or one spirit. Many of your Bibles say one mind. We're going to talk about the tense of that in just a second. I was on staff in Oklahoma 
uh, before I came here, and a coworker of mine came flying in my office. I got to tell you this story. He was so pumped, it was like he had won the lottery. I don't know what that looks like, because I've never met anybody that's won the lottery. I don't even think it happens, but it doesn't matter, because we don't do that. We tithe, and we go to the church. But anyways, here's the deal. He said, have you read the book of Nehemiah lately? I was like, I've read it, but not lately. He said, you, I found the golden nugget. How many of you guys read the Bible for golden nuggets? So if you're honest, you're all like, me, I want the golden nuggets. You know, the, that fresh manna, the, the, the Ramos to go with the logo. Anyways, I said that with an accent, sorry. Anyways, I, I, mean, I, I said I haven't read it lately. But he said, here's the deal. Look, the people are in one mind. They were with one spirit. And look what they accomplished. Look what happened. They were so efficient. They got it done. Do you know where else they were with one mind and they, they were trying to get something done? Do you remember back in the scripture? I'm like, what? Tell me. He said, the Babel, the tower, the thing. Remember that? They were building this thing and, and they were with one mind and one spirit. And God said, that's got to stop because they could get to us. Are you kidding me? You can't even think that way. They were going to build something big enough, grand enough, whatever, to get to God. And God said, no, i got to scatter these people because they're in one mind, one spirit, one heart. And, and he goes, here's the only other time I found in Scripture where God's people came together in one mind. And you see what they did? The impossible. They built the wall in like 50 days. They just rocked it. And they were so efficient. And it's, he goes, look what happens when you trust God's anointed leadership for the vision and the people come together with one mind. What could we do? If we came together as one mind, I'm like, dude, I'm on board. Let's do this. I was excited because it was, now, theologically, I don't know if he could connect the dots in the context of the scripture, but the thought was there. Look what they did with one mind. Look how powerful God's people become with one mind and spirit, especially when God is in it. I said, man, I'm pumped. Nehemiah was a great enough leader during this time to recognize something, and I want you to, to, to focus on this. Don't be afraid of them, he says. He says, put your minds on the master. Singular, plural. All of you put your minds on one thing. Fix your eyes on him. You remember what Shara taught Sunday? Our problems, that illustration. She said, if this is your problem, and it's right here, because this is all you're thinking about, all you're talking about, your prayer, you're even fellowshipping with the problem, because there's nothing else you can see. It's the biggest thing. Once you remove that problem, and you start looking at the bigger picture, it doesn't seem so big anymore. Remember that? I want you to just, just think about this. With God, when you take your problem and your focus off of all of these other things that are the impossibilities of life, and put your mind on the one thing that matters, that's God, look what can happen. The likelihood of us coming together in one heart, one mind, one spirit is there. In your notes, Nehemiah took the focus, the focus off of the massive project and off of those trying to distract and all the other things that could have possibly gone wrong. Remember, they were charging, you know, false taxes against each other and, and hurting each other. There were all these distractions. He took their minds off of that and he put the focus on one thing. Your last answer there is God. So in Nehemiah chapter 4, let's read this together. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. So, he says, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart there it is, King James Version. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. A mind, not minds to work. So you see where that singular focus, the tense of that is. Okay, done. That word mind, or that singular focus, still, it, 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 I don't know if I put it in your notes or not, but it's defined as resolution or determination of will, heart. They were resolute. They were determined in their will. They had the heart to complete the work. It was powerful. So let's see what Nehemiah decided to do in his season of enthusiasm. The season of enthusiasm, I'm, I'll make sense in just a minute, but let's read a portion of the scripture together. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13. Are you ready? If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen, but I, I encourage you to bring your Bible. It says, Therefore, verse 13, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, that one focus he's trying to find, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Remember, he took the focus off of the issues, put it on the one thing that mattered, and he says, now that you know what's worth fighting for, fight for the people you love the most, for the one that's worth fighting for. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, 
and that God had frustrated, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work, each of us having a job. From that day on, half of the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officials posted themselves, I'm sorry, the officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah uh, who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. And each of the builders wore a sword at his side as he worked. But the men who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And that time I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stand inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night. And as workers by day, neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. The idea there is stay armed. Remain ready. Don't go sleep outside the walls where it, the breeze might feel better because the walls aren't blocking. You know what I'm saying? They're, they could have chosen to go anywhere. The walls weren't necessarily complete. They could have been anywhere. They said, no, no, no. We stay together. We're one mind, one heart, one purpose. While one of you is working, the other can rest, okay? But while you're working, you're not only going to be working, but you'll also be on guard. You'll be carrying a sword, a spear, whatever you can handle best. That's what we are supposed to. Does the church need to look any different than that? Are we not engaged in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and other things, as the Word of God says? Isn't Ephesians chapter 6 pretty evident that we need to be dressed in an armor-like fashion, therefore ready and prepared for a battle? Therefore, you are at war with something. So let's, let's focus on that for a second. Um, history. Let me give you a little history note here. In 1948, the Hula Swamps in Tel Aviv. Yeah, have you ever eaten those, uh, those oranges that are Jaffa oranges? You have? Okay, well, that's where this, the, the, this valley is where those oranges are. This, it's actually in Israel, in, the, in, the, in that area. Anyways, many of the Jews that worked on this died of malaria back in the day because it was a swamp land, and it's kind of interesting. Um, they had to, like, use crowbars to move the rocks because they wanted to create irrigation to, to drain out the, the lowland. So basically for however many years, this is like the, the, the largest and oldest lake in the area, and they figured through the years if they could just drain this out, this would be some incredible place for trees like oranges and other things. It would be a commerce. It would be an agricultural thing. And, and even under Turkish rule, it was called the cursed land because everybody that went there to work died of malaria because of the mosquitoes. God literally preserved that land to fulfill prophecy. Israel is now the fourth largest exporter of citrus on the planet because of the work that was done there. The reason why I'm telling you this is because the workers, while they worked on that, they had to have a guard standing by because opposition would come and do random shootings out into the field and shoot people doing the work because they didn't want them doing the work. It's just like Nehemiah's time. It's like history repeating itself. God had called them to do a certain thing. They had set their mind and heart to do it. It was a big task. And those surrounding areas that didn't want that to happen, didn't want the commerce, didn't want the wealth, didn't want prosperity, they came and they started doing random things to them. And as we read this, it's very interesting that it was the Arabs that, or the Arabs that would do this. They passed a law, or Israel at least expressed, we won't retaliate on random shootings. Because apparently that happens a lot out there. They wouldn't do a military response necessarily to this type of shooting. So everyone on the outside heard that, and so they, they staged random shootings. Well, in order to defend this, they did exactly what Nehemiah did. While you work, I'm standing guard next to you. It happens all the time. If you're in a hostile area, if you need to preserve life and get the job done, then you watch each other's back. Hello? All right. Is the church any different than that? Should we assume that just because we're about the business of the Father that we don't have to be watchful or alert? Food for thought. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. As I was reading this, this is a little spin from, from the Nehemiah passage. But I want you to see something. Sober-minded literally means, sober-minded in your notes, write that down, sober-minded. Careful to consider all circumstances and possible consequences. As a believer, we, 
we, if we can be mentored by the Scripture, we need to sometimes take a step back and be careful to consider all the circumstances and possible consequences. It also means temperate, keeping or held within limits. Write that down in your notes. Held within limits. Not running after excessive appetites. The idea of like a roaring lion, this is what intrigued me about this phrase, because we say this all the time, don't we? The devil, the enemy, he's our, he's our opponent, he's the opposition, he's like a roaring lion. I've done illustrations where I did, you know, uh, I had a little fake little poodle, and I stuck it on the ground, I put a light by it, and it made this big deal on the one. I was like, sometimes the enemy is like this little poodle. You know, you know what those little poodles do when you walk by, they go, and they bite at you, and they can't hurt you. They just can nip at you, and, and it's like a gnat. You ever you've been out where the gnats go, and they land on you, and you're like, psh, psh, and you beat yourself silly. They're not going to bite you. They just land on you and annoy you, you know? It's, it's like that. So many times we look at the scripture and say, like a roaring lion, but let's break that down a little bit. There's some significance there. This literally means of men to raise a loud or inarticulate cry, either of grief or joy. What, it, what, do, I, what do I see when I hear that? I, I see like a crowd of people. And a roar of people, men, like at a football game, going, rah, you know, when, when somebody scores and when somebody does something good. Here's, here's, here's the, the other side of it. Because we have an adversary, that adversary is defined as enemy or opponent. You know that's the devil. His name is Satan. He functions as the devil on, on earth, right? Praise God, everybody's on, on, online with me with that. We have an adversary. He's the opponent. So for the sake of exploring all possible scenarios, because we're being vigilant, Let's look at the roar of the crowd. I was, uh, when I was nine years old, I was chosen to be on the sports association traveling team, which made it to the Little League World Series from our area in Spring Branch. And I saw some things, but here's the deal that, that, that sticks out crazy in my head. We played Veracruz, Mexico. They came across, and we, we won every game we played except against them. And I can vividly remember how loud they were in the dugout and how loud their fans were and how crazy obnoxious the roar was of the moment. And I remember it startled me. I can remember being laser focused around everybody else because it was like it wasn't as loud, it didn't mean as much or whatever. But when I got up there and I heard, every, I, I heard everything, so it did seem to me like that could be counterproductive. It could pull me off task. The roar of the crowd, like a roaring lion, could pull me back into a place of anxiety or fear as if I've not experienced this before. There's a movie out, and I don't, I don't ever suggest you go watch movies, but here's one that I saw because I was interested. I'm a baseball player, and it's about Jackie Robinson, okay? And it's called 42. Tons of language, tons of, of bad directive words to him, but that's how he had to live. So I get it. I get it. But this is what I saw. It was fascinating that this man had such courage to go as far as he did. This was the first black man to ever make it into Major League Baseball and play legit because they had two leagues back then. This guy was brought up. He was the one that had to face the roar of the crowd. And when you watch the movie, you hear... He's the only one the whole stadium is focused on and, and just badgering and beating him down. And it's like halfway through you think he's incredible because he's, you, you could see it on his face, it's bothering him, but he's not reacting to it yet. About three quarters of the way in, he breaks. He has to run down. If you're familiar with dugouts, there's usually a tunnel that goes back to the dressing room, especially in a stadium or whatever. And he goes down in the tunnel, takes his bat, and just beats the bat up against the wall and just falls to his ground and begins to weep in brokenness. Weep in brokenness. That wasn't because of his lack of ability. It wasn't because the opponent was too strong. Listen to what I'm saying. It wasn't because he wasn't capable of being great. It was because of the roar. It was because of the voice of those around him. And it stifled his ability. It stifled his heart. It stopped everything that he stood for. He had to exit stage left. Otherwise, he would blow up and become a part of the roar. Nehemiah was focused. When your vision is clear, you don't get caught up in all of that other junk. It's hard, isn't it? This guy, Jackie Robinson, knew all he had to do was make it through the season. He would make history. He was a great ball player. Still in bases, getting on base, you know, getting base hits. His average was astronomically high. He was just a great ball player. It literally almost came to a screeching halt because of people's words. 
your enemy knows a strategy. And God specifically put in there that he can be as if he is a roaring lion. The roar of the crowd. When you get face to face with something as powerful as the vision of God in your life, there can be a roar around you. And I want you to pay attention. Because that roar is meant to stop you. That roar is meant for you to stop your focus and turn and face the situation. And Nehemiah was smart enough. He said, do not let them scare you. Do not listen to them. You do what you came to do. Let's trust in God and let's let him be victorious today. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. When you're at your highest point, Jackie Robinson, he's in the bigs. Highest point, calling his wife, baby, we got a raise. I am, I, I'm going and I'm playing big time now. It's at these moments, the roar will probably increase in your life. And it's at these moments, I want to show you something, how to stay focused. I was uh, watching some TV the other day. I don't watch a lot of TV, which I find it interesting. I'm talking about a movie, and anyways, I'm watching TV. But I wanted to watch the, game, the, the uh, Players' Championship recently. So if you all watched that, you saw Tiger Woods and, and Sergio Garcia were going neck and neck the whole way. It was kind of cool because you got two quote-unquote old guys on the tour now battling it out that are big names. Long story short, because some of you don't even care about golf, here's the deal. <laughs> Tiger pulls out his club before the opponent struck his ball. You'd think, no big deal. But the crowd was so enthusiastic about the choice of club, it meant that Tiger wasn't going to lay up, he's going to go for it. The crowd goes, yeah, like that, and Sergio's, and he hit his ball up into the trees, and he looks over. It was the roar of the crowd that distracted him. I just kind of want to put it in perspective. There's a lot of things in this life. Our ears get perked, especially when we're over the ball of life and we're about to strike in the direction that God's telling us to go. Our ears, I'm telling you, even though you're looking at the ball, your ears go, you want to know what people think. You want to know how others feel about you, but I, I'm, I'm encouraging you, stay focused. Take a step back if you need to. If the roar is, is, is going like this and it's got your attention, take a step back and ask the Lord, where are you at in this? What am I supposed to do? Don't be a victim and don't shank it into the woods. <laughs> Nehemiah was so focused, he understood the vision. And it was so clear that he was able to zone out the roar and the resistance and the chaos and successfully focus on the important things that would bring victory. In your notes, Nehemiah, uh, like Nehemiah, we should plan for resistance and success. Resistance and success. Now, I want you to, in your notes, I don't have this for you, but I need you to draw it. You know what a bell curve looks like, right? Like this. So like you're drawing a bell with the, without the handle. So just go up and down. Do that for me in the, the blank space, space that you have. I was with a friend of mine recently, and sometimes friends come to my office and say, hey, can we meet? I'm going through a season in my life. I want to share it with you. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm in accountability mode with him. Sometimes I'm in mentor mode with him. It's just, in this particular case, it's a friend. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's just talk about it. And he says, I feel like there are too many things happening in my life right now for me to be good at any of it. I want to take a step back, but I don't know where to begin. I said, okay, no problem at all. Let's just talk about today. How do you feel today? His face lit up. And, and this will make sense in a second. He's like, I don't think I've ever been in a better season in my life. I'm telling you, things are awesome. And I said, hold that thought. I grabbed my, my whiteboard marker and I chunked it on him. I said, get your rear up there on that board. I'm draw all this bell curve, okay? This bell curve is a representation of life. And I said, on this bell curve, where are you right now? You're not at the top yet because that's ultimate celebration and so forth. You're probably somewhere down right before the top. All right? He goes, yeah, I'm right, right up there. So he drew a line. I said, fantastic. That's where you are today. But let me remind you, where were you six months ago? He goes, man, I was fasting 40 days. I was, I was calling a, a therapist because I needed that. And I, 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 I uh, uh, had a girlfriend, and I had all these things that, but I, I was creating space for God to fill. He spoke into my life. I gave direction to my leadership team, and, and, and we are today as a result Remember, the decisions you make in the valley determine 
the success or the celebration moment in, in that, that mountaintop experience, right? It's usually when you get to the mountaintop, you see all the other mountaintops God wants you to get to. You can't see it in the valley. So while he's down in the valley, he's, he's hurting. He's fasting. He's creating space for God, right? And I said, that is your low valley. Here you are today. Now, in your bell curve, okay, as it goes like this, where the line is, kind of down from the top, start another bell curve and go up. What if God is telling you today, the valley, the decision, the work you did, Nehemiah, he's in the valley, he's broken, he's fasting, he's got the burden. Now he comes through that valley and he's working on the wall, right? He's doing the things he's supposed to do. They could have stopped and celebrated on so many levels, but he kept increasing the bell curve. Right when he got to a place where people wanted to stop and take a break, he goes, no, we're going to do this. We're going to shore up the gaps. And right when they get to that place, no, we're going to fix the gates. No, you're going to come inside and we're going to stay armed. We're going to stay put. So in my buddy's life, I said, you went through this valley. As a result, you're in, you're, you're in the most enthusiastic stage of your life. What if God's telling you right now, start another bell curve and let this be your next valley? How cool would that be? If you thought it through and asked God to now be a part of your life, you want to go to the next level. You can already dream of places you know God is calling you to do and things to achieve and people to meet and, and so forth. You understand what I'm saying? Why go to the top of that and slide all the way back down into the emotional pit that you came from why not take the experience of your fast and apply it today begin to do some measure of that again and create space for God to take you to the next level if you invested into the leaders around you at such a level back then why don't you revisit that and, and perpetuate that here let today be your next valley why can't we do that as believers why can't we do that you can if you're paying attention and you have vision that's the difference. If you don't have a plan, you don't have vision, you can't look at the whiteboard and, and even know where you are. You seem to like have these things, the highs and lows and the highs and lows and the highs and lows. Take out the lows. As you're approaching the highs, take a moment and start another one. Pay attention because your life is an ebb and flow of decisions in the valley, celebrations on the mountaintop. But with every mountaintop experience, you should expect another valley in another mountain, another valley, in another mountain. You've not arrived until you get to heaven. So why not achieve higher heights? Uh, I'm, this, is a, this is an analogy, but I, I'm, I'm applying it as if from glory to glory, as we say, from, you know, celebration to celebration, whatever you want to call it. Let's think of it this way. As I was going through it and, and prayerfully considering giving this to you, Nehemiah is a great leader. He's got great leadership you know, principles that are out there that we apply every day in our life. I want to see that in my life. I, I had never thought of that before, and I'm sitting there on my couch. He's up there drawing the bell curve, just jumping up and down, going, I can see that this is another, oh my goodness, and I'm going to do this, and, and I can pray strategically here, and God is already opening doors here, and he started going on this other bell curve, and he was teaching me the whole time. So I wanted to share that with you. I believe it connects with the life of Nehemiah. I believe it connects with the idea of staying armed. Because if all he now has is this enthusiastic moment or season in his life, what is his next moment? The other side of that bell curve can be a slippery slope back down into the depression that fostered all of that prayer and fostered all that work and fostered all that attention to get him to where he was. Make sense? So stay armed. In those moments, recalibrate. If you're having just an amazing season of life right now, recalibrate. Let that be your next valley. Focus and position. Create space in your life for God to speak into you. Stay and shore the gaps like Nehemiah would suggest. Stay on the wall and don't come down until you're finished. See what I'm saying? Stand with me. Let's pray. And let's just ask God to begin to just expand that idea in your heart. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and then I'll, I'll direct you in prayer. So where are you today? This is a great vantage point for us to, to evaluate this. Are you in a valley? It's okay. Because you know, <laughs> really everything can just be up from here. Do you need to be sober and watchful? Because you, you might need to recalibrate and kind of re reposition for a next 
Israel? Do you need to position yourself and join others with one mind to watch each other's back or to stay alert? So perhaps you've let your guard down because you were in a great position or an enthusiastic season of life, and now all of a sudden you're experiencing another valley, and it has the potential to wear you back down like you were before. I'm going to ask you to apply the lessons and the best practices that you've learned in your, from your last valley, perhaps from some of these teachings and from those around you that you love. Ask God to help you recapture the momentum of success and preparedness. Nehemiah would suggest to you to remain armed. Tonight I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to consider if you've kept your sword with you. Nehemiah said, even as you work, I'm going to ask that you keep your sword with you. Have you done that? In the activities of life, have you put your sword down? I'm just going to tell you, the sword in your life is the word of God. If you've ever tried to go a single day without this sword, Nehemiah would mentor you into a place to suggest, pick your sword up. Don't ever go anywhere without your sword. Don't go anywhere. Be in any position. Do not be vulnerable without it. That's the Bible. And that's the word. The second one is this. If you have this sword, are you prepared to apply it to your life? Are you ready to apply it to your life? Our prayer time is simply this. God, give us the courage to carry our sword and the faith to apply it in our life. Just take a few moments to pray. And I'll close in a moment. Would you stand with me as this song continues? Just begin to express openly in your own way how much you appreciate a God that cares about you to give you a living word, something you can put handles on, something you can carry by faith, home with you. The word of God is truth. It's living. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Come on, just, just say thank you for all of this because this is the, the light into our path. 
and a lamp into our feet, as the psalmist suggests. This is the bread of life into our souls that are hungry. Father, we glorify you, we bless you, because you gave us the word. You gave us the word in flesh, and now in spirit, he now lives within us to recall all of the logos that we read, all of the words in your word. God, we love you. Jesus. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for encouraging us and allowing someone like Nehemiah to mentor us, to speak into our life through the scripture, stuff to challenge us in various walks in our life. I know the word is is alive and therefore it shines brightly in our life in different seasons to mean sometimes different things but the the backbone the very foundation of it is simply this to find and to place our trust in you and to have courage uh, to to walk in obedience in the things that you've asked us to we're asking you to make clear the vision of our heart before we can go anywhere we have to be with one mind and that one mind needs to be for your glory and not ours we will build your kingdom we will glorify you and make you famous. But we do that together, not as individuals. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to ask uh, Roger and Chrissy, would you guys come up? While they're coming up, I didn't ask them to be prepared for anything, so no worries. I'm not going to give you a mic. But I, I, if, if you guys could, like, everybody just come a little closer so I can. There's got to be a little proximity in what I'm about to do, if you don't mind. Just come closer, please. <laughs> Thank you. And this is not going to get weird. We're just going to reach our hands forward and we're going to pray for Roger and Christy. And here's why. Um, this, this week has become, you know, Roger was on a trip for me. And while he was gone, God has been pounding my heart about what's next. What's next? Are you ready? Because I'm reading Nehemiah and now I'm, I'm all of a sudden super challenged in the clarity of our vision as a church. You, you understand that for you, the life flow is the key ingredient for you. Having a place, a systematic approach, so to speak, for next steps. That's what the church is all about for you. But this church for this community is something completely different. It is, it is a beacon. It's a light. It's hope. It needs to be recognizable. It needs to have a name. People need to know you and know what you stand for as a church. These guys are in Cyprus. And Monday is a pivotal day for our organization because Monday we're going to sit with a developer of a large development and we are asking God to convince, if you will, let me, let me just back up, that might sound wrong. Wouldn't you like to be a part of a church, listen very closely, would you like to be a part of a church that communities begged us to be a part of? This is what's on my heart. The church has historically driven itself out beyond the boundaries of community and said, come to us. Think about it. Think about it. And the government, I'm going to say it in its own record, has this vibe about it that the church will ultimately become extinct, therefore losing its status, its influence, and so forth. And we're not helping it because we keep driving ourselves away from community saying, come to us, build around that. God has called me as a leader and this church under my leadership to turn and become a part of the fabric of the community. It's taken us a long time for this culture shift to happen here and it's still happening. You'll hear a grander picture of this later. I have to talk to our board and they're probably going, oh goodness, and that's Monday. Okay, full circle. We have the opportunity to sit before a developer that is going to be developing a massive community 
and we are at phase two now. Phase one was to have a campus, and these guys have helped lead that campus to 100 people strong. I don't know, you're averaging 90, 98, 97, 98 now. as an average every single week, and we have two hours to be an influence in the school. Two hours out of the week, 100 people are showing up. I want to be there every day where the people are. That's how you are woven into the fabric of the community. That's how relationship begins to leverage ministry. Proximity suggests that the more we're around people, the more likely they are to need ministry and trust us for it. While all the other big organizations and churches are going out and building on islands, we're wanting to go in. I'm going to talk to the developers, and I'm going to pitch them the vision in our heart. And I'm going to ask them to consider us in their development. It's a, it's, a, it's a next step. It's not even the place that we really want to go yet. That's four or five years down the road. But we have an opportunity Monday. And I, the reason why I wanted you to come forward is I want you to pray for us. Pray for Roger and Chrissy. This development will be hinged around a community's acceptance. God has positioned them. He, are you still on the activities board for that particular place? You better get back on that's what I'm talking about. He's had influence at various levels, but we're going, to stay, we're going to stay visible. I mean, this is something that he's not even heard everything about. And I'm telling you, it's just been this week that I've lost sleep in a good way. I've been up all night dreaming and fashioning, calling people and, and putting it all together. And he's about to get hammered with all of it. But here's the deal. We need your prayer. If you want your church to be the church where communities call us and say, come to us, we need that kind of thing with us. That's the church that we're going to build for Christ. Because we want to be where the people are. If all the rest of the nation feels like they can go without the church, when people come here and try to make that decision, I want this to be the hardest decision that they can make because the, the people cry out for the need of the church in their community. And we're going to turn it. We're going to switch it around. And we're going to be that church. All right? So I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Monday's a big day. It's our board meeting. It's our meeting with this other. And I just, can we do that? Would you reach your hands forward? If, if, if you're here, just... Let's just cry out to God. God, I just stand right here, and I believe, Lord, as leaders, you give us vision. This vision is real. It's something we can't shake, and it's something we can't fund, nor can we convince, you know, in our own right, our own words, and our own attitude, things to change. This is bigger than us. Soften the hearts of those that need to hear your voice. Begin to, 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 to let questions, of, of directional questions, drop in the hearts of these developers to, to consider well, maybe that's a great idea. No, that is a great idea. We need this church. We need this organization to be a part of our plans. They will bring people to us, and as long as they stay, we grow as a community. People are met at the point of their need. Relationships are built. This becomes a place where people want to come and not a place where people are driven away. We want to be that church that is invited into the community to bring life that is the church you've called us to. These are our leaders. God, I pray for anointing and favor and direction for supernatural provision, God. Like Nehemiah, we will know this vision better than anybody. We'll be able to articulate it with a heavy burden. But God, you have to provide. And if, if you provide and the vision is there, I pray that we come together with one mind and one spirit and one purpose to glorify you and to perpetuate the glory of Jesus Christ to a lost world. That is our goal. That is our job. We are to shine in dark places, making it less dark. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 All right. We're going to be about our business. You be about yours. Stay on the wall. Do a good thing. Stay armed. And join me Sunday. It's going to be an awesome weekend. Whether you're here, you're at Cyprus, or viewing.